Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, rebirth of the spiritual warrior. I'm not going to say anything. I've already said what I had to say about awesome titles. Anyway, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Spirituality is a major problem in the world today and especially in a world that's become increasingly materialistic and increasingly uh, filled with distraction that comes with small devices and big ones where people are genuinely disconnected from each other in even normal conversation. Uh, for two people to even genuinely have a conversation with each other is very difficult without having a mobile device interject with a text message or a Facebook update or a, you know an email or something. So people don't even make eye contact with each other while they're talking. And in this world of fast messaging and rapid response and you know 30 second videos and all of that, our attention span has really suffered. As a result of which, it's gonna be just as a psychological exercise in this hall, there's a, quite a few number of people sitting here, try not touching your phone for the entirety of this talk. See how hard that is. Because it's gonna be hard. You, can't even, you won't even realize that you're doing it. You just, you have to meddle with it, turn it on, did anybody send anything, and turn it back off, and then look at it, how much battery is left. You just, you can't help yourself. And this is what we've become. We, we have a more intimate relationship with our devices than we have with each other. Now, e at least each other, we see each other. The relationship we're supposed to have with Allah, we don't see Allah Azza wa Jalla. So it requires a special amount of attention. It requires an extreme amount of focus compared to what we have now even for each other to really gain some sort of spiritual you know, experience, right? So spiritual experiences for most people have become uncommon and they happen rarely. Rarely do they feel a moment where they're really genuinely connected to Allah. And they have that moment and it's very beautiful but then it goes away and they think about that moment and say, when can I get that back? Maybe that happened to you in the month of Ramadan or something. You know, in the middle of one of the prayers. Maybe that happened to you in the middle of a khutbah, just for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. And I cannot describe that feeling to you, nor can you describe that feeling to me, because that feeling is, in fact, in fact indescribable. I'll tell you something personal about my own spirituality. This year at Hajj, I have probably never, ever felt closer to Allah, not even by a long shot, the way I did the day of Arafah. The day of Arafah when we just have to sit from the afternoon until you know the, the, the setting of the sun, just sit there and talk to God, just talk to Allah. And you can't even do any official prayers. You don't even you know get up and make the, the rakaat and things like that. You just sit there and you make dua. You just make dua. And so I'm sitting there about six, seven hours, eight hours, you know, just in one place, and all I'm doing is making dua. It does something to you. You start actually engaging a line conversation. Those du'as start become, they stop becoming artificial words that you've memorized and you're reiterating the ones that you've learned since childhood. You know, the ones that your parents made you memorize. Not just, they don't just become that. They become actual words you're, you're dealing with Allah with. And they start becoming a reflection on yourself. The tears start rolling down your eyes and you can't even stop them. You start apologizing to Allah as though you can see Him. Even though you can't. And this, ha this is a real spiritual experience, and at the heart of that experience is a conversation with Allah. I started this talk with how we don't even have genuine conversation with each other anymore. You recall, just a few seconds ago? I brought that up because at the, at the heart of spirituality is the slave of Allah, the servant of Allah, engaging in conversation with Allah, a conscious conversation, not a whatever conversation. Not a whatever conversation. Not an artificial conversation. You know, let me give you an example of an artificial conversation. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> Completely artificial. You may not be doing well at all. You say, good, pretty good, pretty good. Because you don't feel connected enough to this person to let them know how you're really doing. So you stick to the generic, pretty good, alhamdulillah, it's okay. But if someone I love, someone I trust, Someone I know I can talk to. Someone I know will not tell my problems to others. Someone I know whose advice is going to help me calls and says, how's it going? I'm not good, bro. I need to talk to you. We need to talk. 
I've got a serious issue, I just need to hear what you have to say about it. Wouldn't that happen? That is the kind of conversation we're supposed to have with Allah. We, are, we need to, if we're going to engage in real spirituality, we have to actually go beyond the artificial... SubhanAllah, 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 Done. It's cool, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. But it's not spirituality, and you're not, you're not fulfilled from that. You're not. So, what I want to talk to you about in these few minutes that I have, and I don't even think I'll need the entire 30 minutes. I just have practical tips for myself and for all of you to how to get to spirituality. It's not going to happen overnight. How do we start having genuine spiritual experiences, and really reviving our faith through these genuine spiritual experiences, and make them a more common occurrence than they are right now? How do we practically do that? The first bit of advice I have for you is go to sleep early. I know, I'm talking to students. Why would you say such a thing? It doesn't make any sense to us. We don't know what that means. What is this word early of which you speak? <laughs> I haven't heard this before. <laughs> you know, go to sleep early. Because going to sleep early means you'll wake up early. And waking up early means you'll be fresh for Fajr. The first prayer of the morning determines the spiritual health of the rest of your day. If your fajr is not intact, your entire day is not intact. Forget it. You're going to have a lousy day. You need to start your day with a beautiful, direct conversation with Allah. And fajr has a specific importance from a spiritual perspective. Not only that Allah tells us in the Qur'an, إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مَشْهُودًا That the Qur'an recited at fajr, the Qur'an of fajr will actually be witnessed has been witnessed. And it's, ulama have debated and talked about the word mashhud and how it even suggests that Allah Himself is special witness to you getting up in the morning and praying to Him and talking to Him. But Fajr is a time when most of the world is asleep. So you don't, you're not distracted. Nobody's sending you text messages at Fajr. Nobody's sending you an email. There's nothing to do with your device. It's just you and Allah. Maybe even every, your roommates are asleep. Your friends are asleep. Everybody's asleep. Maybe even the rest of your family is asleep. It's just you and Allah. It's the best time to engage in conversation with Allah. And I'm not saying that tomorrow morning when you wake up for Fajr by Allah's permission and you're going to pray, it's going to be a spiritual experience. But if you start taking care of your sleep at night and you wake up fresh, you have better chances. You have better chances. You need to take care of that. And the other, the second bit of advice, not just go to sleep on time, pray Isha as soon as it comes in. I shall say that again. Pray Isha when? You'll say it for me now. As soon as it comes in. Don't wait for it. Oh, it just came in at 7.30. I got time. 9 o'clock. I got time. 10.30. I got time. 11 o'clock. I got time. 12. I got, let me just sleep a little bit. I'll wake up and pray. Extra late fudge your special session. <laughs> right? Extra, extra late Isha. Don't do that to Isha. Pray Isha at its time. And actually, if... Uh, I, I know that uh, uh, there's going to be a session later on, not by me, but others on, on time management. I'm not going to give you a session on time management, but spiritually speaking, in the, in, in the sense of spirituality, if you can really work on marking down your time for the evening prayer, the Isha prayer, and therefore fixing your Fajr prayer, then you are on the road to spiritual success. You are well on that road. Now, let's talk about Fajr a little bit. What you need to do as students, I mean, I'm not giving you heavy lofty goals, like have khushu' in every word you recite, have full concentration and cry in every word you recite. You're not going to get there anytime soon. It's okay. It's okay. Just pray Fajr on time, and what right now? Aisha. Fajr, Fajr, on time. And for, for brothers, if you can pray in jama'ah, it is so much better for you. It is so, and you will feel the experience, and you'll feel the difference in your day, if you can make it to the masjid for Fajr. You will feel the difference. It'll affect the way you study, it's going to affect the way you carry out your day, you're going to have more, everything you do will have more blessings in it, and you will notice it. There's going to be a positivity to everything you do. It's textured by that Fajr prayer. Now, the thing you want to do little by little, your minds are fresh right now, and I know you don't think so, but you have a lot of free time. You have an insane amount of free time. And if you don't believe me, you will after you graduate and start working. And you will look back and say, man, I had a lot of free time. Now you waste a lot of that time. But I'm saying if you can dedicate some of that time to memorization. Memorization. 
Now, specifically, there's two things I would like you to consider memorizing. One, I want you to start memorizing select surahs from the Qur'an. Just short ones, easy ones to memorize. You can pick ones from Juz Amma, it's okay. If you don't know any surahs, you don't have to tell anybody about that. Just start memorizing little by little by little on your own. Even if it takes you six months to do one page, it's okay. It's you, just between you and Allah, that's it. His, he, you love Him so much, you want to memorize some of what He has to say. That's all this is, right? Now, just as an added resource on, on, uh, on, in my, on my institution's website, on bayina.com, there are podcasts for every surah of Juz Amma. For the 30th section of the Qur'an, for every surah, every chapter in there, there's a detailed lecture study of it. Memorize it, then listen to the lecture. And if there are other teachers, other scholars, other videos out there that are describing the surahs, listen to that. Why? Because now what you've memorized, even if you don't know Arabic, if you've memorized it and you've heard a detailed explanation of it, you don't just have a parrot-like relationship with these words, you, you know something about the depth, the wisdom, in the guidance in these words. So you have a real relationship with these words, and that's the, my motivation for putting the podcast up is that, for Juz Amma particularly. Because most people will memorize something from that, at least they have something that they can listen to, and say, okay, that's what this is talking about. Now what happens is when you recite the surah, if you, can, if you can't even concentrate, at least you try to remember what was said about the surah, or something, it's, it's more concentration than you had before. It's more than what you had before. At least now, when you're standing there and praying, and you're looking down at that really creative musalla rug that you bought, you're not wondering about this one going, this t turny thingy going that way, and this one going to three, but this one's four. Why is that? It's asymmetrical. And, you're, you know, and while you're in sajda, you're trying to fix it. You know, and so, <laughs> at least you're not doing that. So, I say 80% of your memorization efforts should go towards Qur'an, 80%. I'm just throwing a number out there, okay? And 20% of your memorization efforts, here goes, should go towards memorizing special prayers, special du'as. Small book, Fortress of the Muslim, costs five bucks. You can get it pretty much from any Islamic bookstore. Get a, hand, get a, get a hold of it. There are probably PDFs online anyway, of it, if, you, if you're that, you know, the economy is tough for you, then that's fine. So download the PDF. I think there's even apps out there for it now. Memorize the dua for entering the house and leaving the house, putting the clothes on and taking the clothes off, going into the bathroom and coming out of the bathroom. Once, one dua a week. Not even everything in one shot, one dua a week. And add it into your day. Now when you get up, you know what dua, well, how to, what to say to Allah when you wake up. Now when you're about to go to sleep, and, and what's beautiful about those duas is the meanings are all there. It's translated for you, right? You don't need an in-depth analysis, they're very self-explanatory. And these are, why are these du'as important? Because they are the Prophet's own spiritual practice, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now you're trying to introduce spirituality in your life by adopting the Prophet's own spiritual practices, alayhi salatu wa sallam. And that's why this is a really effective way of you starting to engage with Allah. Outside of the context of prayer. You sit in the car, you make the du'a for travel. And you know, the other really cool thing to do is when you make the du'a for travel and you're not familiar with the Arabic language, to even at least remind yourself of what you read in translation. What did that mean? Oh yeah. SubhanAllah. And then begin your journey. And then start driving your car. This will necessarily start impacting how conscious you are of Allah on a daily basis. Because what these du'as, the, you know, they're basically these are, these are supplications and du'as for all occasions, right? Eating, sleeping, meeting friends, departing, etc., etc. Every, every circumstance in life, there's a prayer for it in Islam. There's a small prayer for it. What that does is, you don't experience anything in life that is not an excuse to remember Allah. That's what that does. It makes every circumstance of life a spiritual opportunity. That's what it does. And that's the beauty of these du'as. So I said, first, work on your prayer by memorizing a little bit more of the Qur'an and understanding what you've memorized. And two, little by little, one dua a week, one dua, not more than that. What was the name of the book I mentioned? Fortress of the Muslim, just one dua a week and add it to your regimen. Don't just memorize a dua and not use it. I say one a week because you memorize it, maybe you can pull it off in a day. The rest of the six days, you make it a point to use it. To actually use it. You don't have to memorize every dua in that book. Pick the ones you like. It's okay, you can be selective. Pick the ones you like. Like if you don't ever go to the masjid, don't, memorize, don't start with memorizing the dua for going into the masjid. Don't start with that. Start with the one you're going to use. You know? 
Yeah, and if you find a section, you know, selling a camel or something, and don't, don't do that yet. You're a, you're a couple of months away from selling camels, so just don't worry about that yet, okay? So, <laughs> so this, that, that's what I'm trying to say as far as spirit, practical spiritual practices are concerned. Now, I'll leave you with this thought. I mean, I, I really just want to give you little that you can accomplish. And I tell you, awwalu ghayti qatar thumma yanhamir, as they say in Arabic, the first of the rain is a drop and then it pours. These little, little things, they add up to a lot. Don't underestimate their value. Don't think, how am I going to become the spiritual warrior? <laughs> Don't worry about it, you'll get there. You have, to, you have to get your training with little, small, small steps, baby steps, and inshallah ta'ala you will get there. Now, another, just a long-term goal. This is not a short-term goal, it's a long-term goal. One of, for me personally, uh, I've come, and this may not be true for everyone, but I know it's true for a lot of Muslims. My personal spirituality and the spirituality that I'm trying to teach my children is rooted in their relationship with the Qur'an. It's rooted in their relationship with the Qur'an. I want them to have a personal relationship with this book. Not just in, in, in the sense that they can memorize it and recite it well, but actually that they're engaged in it as though Allah is talking to them when they're reciting it. So they have a direct, con direct conversation with Allah every time they're reciting the Qur'an. And I feel that is the most sustainable you know, approach to spirituality. If you can develop that over time, then you actually have the, the, the endless wellspring of spiritual, the, the spiritual fountain is there for you. You can constantly drink from it. Every prayer will automatically be become a spiritual experience. Even if the Imam is leading the prayer and he's reciting the passage, you don't even know. Because you have a direct relationship with the Quran, you will actually benefit from every, every single instance of prayer and every single instance of memorization. Now, how do you do that? Well, obviously the big hurdle before us in the Quran, there is a language barrier, right? And that language barrier, of course, is the Arabic language. Uh, Some of you speak Arabic, but that ain't Arabic. Let me just tell you. That's either Egyptian or Syrian or Palestinian, it's Fadahi, it's Ambiya, it's this, you know, one dialect or the other. That is not the Arabic of the Quran. And there's clearly a difference between them. So, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. You showed me a card. I shall remember that. Okay. So, what was I saying? Something about Adar Ali or something? Creation story? No? Something about Arabic? Okay, yeah. So, my thing is, there is a way, me personally, my, my career as an Arabic teacher, that's what I do, I teach Arabic. And I, as a student in college, when I was trying to learn Arabic, I realized something. Arabic is this endless ocean, just like the Quran is also actually an endless ocean of knowledge. You're going to be a student of Arabic for your entire life and you still won't know much. That's just how it is. I've, I've been studying the language since 1999, and I still feel like I'm, I'm about to pass the beginner level. I feel like that, you know? But regardless, there is a minimal level of Arabic you can learn with very little effort that can get you functional with the Qur'an. It is possible. It is possible. And it doesn't require a lot of time from you. It requires maybe 10, 15, at the most 20 minutes a day. At the most. And not even every day. Maybe three, maybe four days a week. 15 to 20 minutes a day, three to four days a week. And I believe in that philosophy. So I decided to experiment with that philosophy with my daughter. I mean, children make the best test subjects, and they're available. You don't have to pay them. I mean, you know, so my, my eldest daughter, Husna, I started teaching her Arabic about 15 minutes a day. And it's not Arabic reading the alphabet. She's past that point, having her understand the Arabic grammar as it applies to the Qur'an, so she can make sense of the text little by little by little. That's what I started doing. My agenda was I'm going to teach her that way for two years, but it'll just be 15 minutes a day. I've been doing that for six to eight months now. Alhamdulillah. You can check out her progress. And I, I actually, I, I recorded the session because I wanted other people to benefit from those lessons too. People with a time constraint, people that are intimidated by, you know, the ocean that is Arabic, or the mountain that is Arabic, but they can develop that little by little. Now, I recommend Arabic studies because I believe it does have to do with your spirituality over time. It, I'm not saying you need Arabic to be spiritual, but if you want sustained spirituality, if you want sustained spirituality, then you're going to have to, in my opinion, develop a direct connection with the Qur'an. And that's going to be very difficult until you have some level of Arabic. And some level of Arabic is not hard to attain. It is not hard to attain. Can I get all of you now to take out your cell phones? I want you to send a text message. Do it, do it, do it. I'm serious. 
not to each other. God, I'll give you a phone number. I want you to first write the text message. The text message is your email address. The text message is your email address. Your phone's dead? You are so missing this party. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah, fat fingers and iPhones don't work together. Come on, have your email address. Here's the number. 972 696 7171. It's not my number. 97? Sure, yeah. 972 696 7171. Say that, repeat. Free? You'll find out. Okay. So here's what it is. I came, I came to this MSA, this is the last you know, talk I'm giving here. I'm heading back, inshallah. I've actually, I'm cutting down on travel personally. I used to travel quite a bit to conduct seminars and classes. And um, I haven't been very much involved in the MSA scene. I've been out of it for some time. But I've decided to at least give some time to MSAs. And this is actually probably the only MSA conference that I've agreed to in the last couple of years. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that I got the chance to come. I'm very happy that I got to have some conversation with you guys. And on behalf of the organization that I'm from, from, from Bayina, I want to actually extend a gift to you, which is this, this text message that I'm sending you. Some of you already received the email. It's basically the first few lessons I teach my daughter. And I want you to experiment with it. See if you can do it. And if you can, good for you. If not, it's all good. But uh, do remember the main advice I gave you today. Try to remember that. Make Fajr and Aisha a priority, number one. What was number two? What was number two? Memorize some Qur'an and listen to what? Listen to what? Lectures, explanations of what you're memorizing. That's going to be important. And what was number three? What was number three? What was that book again? Fortress of Muslim. Some main prayers that you're going to be using, some main du'as that you're going to be using every day, inshallah, that will bring a lot of spirituality into your life. Thank you so very much for listening, and I'm really glad for the hospitality and the, the wonderful comments and questions I received. Jazakallah for the